this is sort of today's flow. Uh, we're going to start with picking up where we left off on science of learning, um, then inquiries linked to science. That's like, I really want to make sure this sticks with you. Uh, we're going to do some activities um, and then end with some just leadership guidance around PBL, which is um, like the reality of this stuff. Uh, okay, so jumping in, we left off on Tuesday with the science of learning. And I actually, you know, I gave you a, hey, it would be awesome if you went and checked out this amazing document on the essential guiding principles for whole child design uh, and all of the research base that lives behind what deeper learning is, right? Like a lot of you are in the business of either leading a deeper learning school, leading a deeper learning professional development team. The more you can ground yourself in the research, the better. This document is sort of a one-stop shop for so much goodness around why we do deeper learning the way we do. Um, okay, but inside of that, of course, is this thing. So if you look on this slide, you see down at the very bottom of their circle, of those five parts of the circle, the rich learning experiences and knowledge development, okay? When you pop that one open, it pops open into this series of sort of clear scientific findings. Right. So children actively construct knowledge based on their experiences, relationships and social constructs. Variability in learning is the norm, not the exception. Motivation and performance are shaped by the nature of learning tasks and contexts. So motivation is not fixed. Motivation is responsive to what the kids are seeing. Um, transferable learning requires application of knowledge to authentic tasks and students' beliefs about themselves, their abilities, and their supports shape their learning, right? That's a self-efficacy thing that we probably know, but just a good reminder that their self-efficacy is a really critical driver in what will actually happen. Uh, the students control learning, right? This is the Ken Robinson reminder um, that we are like gardeners. They will grow themselves. They control learning and growth. We as educators are like gardeners trying to set the right conditions. Um, and so in the chat, I'm curious, based off of these sort of scientific findings about how we know that knowledge is developed and made durable for kids, what current school practices are running counter uh, inside the classroom? Like, let's focus inside the classroom. Like, what are we doing inside of our classrooms? that isn't really linking up with these sort of core scientific findings around how children retain knowledge. All right, over in chat, feel free, throw it out there. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Yes, teaching to the middle and sort of assuming there's this vast middle that there's a magical kid somewhere in the middle there. I don't, I don't, I don't know how we got to that place. Very norm referenced, bell curve kind of thinking. Yeah, Janelle, righto, everyone, and to the point of some districts take this so far that like they literally want every single kid in the entire district on the same textbook page on the same day. Like, that's, I mean, definitely not what the science would say to do. Love these coming in. And others, shout out. You can shout out into the room too. I mean, I'm, I just want everyone participatory and moving, but feel free to jump in. Teaching to the test, yeah, that keeps coming up a lot. You know, in some of the schools I work with, it's about workbooks, especially sort of, um, you know, British schools. They have someone come in and they actually have to sh show the workbook and show that the page is actually filled out. And so it was a big problem during online learning and we were helping people move to a to an online environment and they were the the thing that was stressing people out literally was how do we print out that work that they're doing in an online space and put it in the book so it was like forget about what was taking place and the knowledge and evidence of learning but how are we actually going to put that in the book it was, and, and, and it's not that they really believe that that is something that, you know, is beneficial, but it was like sort of big brother's going to be watching. And, and if it's not in the book, we're going to get in trouble. It was unbelievable. Yeah, lovely. I love that. They keep coming. Yeah. So I think we have a really good sense of some things that don't fit well with what we know about how kids 
learn. I mean, look at it's still coming. Yeah, the quizzes yeah. and tests, all very abstract. I love the thinking about like these these tasks completely removed from relevance or authenticity and no real sense of why a kid is doing a thing. I mean, I can tell you from my own experience, like I am now a deeply passionate lover of science. So I love it. I, I will spend hours watching science YouTube videos. And I didn't feel like I got any of that in school. And I, I, I'm really sort of disappointed looking back about like no one lit a fire for me that was clearly there. Uh, like, so, and I mean, you know, I don't like going back in time and blaming, but I, I mean, it, it bothers <laughs> me now that I wasn't more interested earlier. Okay, lovely. Now, as you can get a qu pretty quick sense, like, so if this is some of the core findings of, of what we know about how children learn, like this is gonna link pretty quickly to a different kind of approach inside of the classroom. It's that approach that PBL is such a good fit for. And so we're gonna, we're gonna get to PBL, but before we spend too much time there, um, let's, let's just let the science of learning folks. So like one of the things I wanna re really, re I'm, obviously you can see how much I'm reinforcing science of learning. But they, um, they do a good job in that section of, of doing the from to, right? Like that's one of the other key takeaways during this entire uh, What School Could Be Academy experience with you all is we're constantly trying to do the from to help people see the, an old practice to the new practice. Um, and so for, for them, you can see that they, this is what they would be trying to, to move us from and to. And I, it's not a shock that a lot of stuff we just put in the chat lives over there on the left-hand side of that transforming a school from. And so for those leading professional learning and those, you know, having talking or training, training teachers and talking with parents or, or people, this, uh, this is a very, you know, we, we sort of situated it with like behaviorism to constructivism. It's a very like, it's a great way to simplify concepts or to give language to concepts so that everybody sort of has this understanding. And so that like this chart as well is something that is very easy for people to like, it demonstrates what we're talking about in a very concise manner, better than I am explaining it right now. But uh, so what I'm saying is like, this is an example of much of what is actually um, provided in this science of learning website. So that's why we get so excited about it because it, take the time to dive in there because you're going to get resources like this. <clears throat> All right. So now, and they also have lots of great videos. We'll do just a quick clip of this one, which is linking this science of learning stuff to PBL directly, right? So this, there, there's a great video out there that does that job, science of learning to PBL, right? Okay, so we'll take a quick, Quick look at it. Um, is my audio turned on properly? Yeah, ben, is it yeah, yeah, it looks problem? good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sounds great. Linear figure, take 10 microliters of the DNA you just extracted and put it in the middle well. We have evidence from many, many studies that students who engage in authentic learning and inquiry based learning do as well as others on standardized tests and do much better on real assessments and real tasks of critical thinking and problem solving that are going to make a bigger difference for them in the long run, in school and in life. Today we're working on our final models, assembling the parts that you've cut out. Yeah, that's good. And if and we then, can't get it straight, we can just sand it a little bit. Yeah. So. There are many aspects of what goes on in a well-designed project that deepen understanding, that open up the brain for learning and also create connections that will allow that learning to be transferred to new situations. Go ahead, guys. In project-based learning, we build on the knowledge that kids bring to the table. Ground of the play structure is not safe. We can say to the person who made the park to fix the park. They are extending what they know into an area of inquiry, which is motivating and exciting to them. 
So what does the sanitation department do to help citizens? It helps the environment be clean. There you go. When a student is deeply engaged in a project, their brain is awake and alert because they are engaged and they're interested. That engaged brain operates on connections, connecting what we know to what we are now learning, connecting what we experienced today to what we experienced yesterday. Oh, yeah. So Mrs. Roberts. Okay, let's stop. Um, there's more to it. You can go check it out. But I, I, I love whenever we can make those connections to the science side of it and what's actually happening up here for kids. Um, that is, I think, always, always, always a good thing. And I think that fits well with what we, we see in the project-based world. I mean, kids are engaged, curious in all, the, all of those things that are telling us that like their brains are on uh, and they're actively learning. We, we see those things more frequently in a project than we see them with worksheets and lecture. It's not to say there is not a place for worksheets and lecture. There, are, there is a place for worksheets and lecture. So one of the misnomers, I think, of uh, the entire deeper learning world is that we have to be all in. And it's got to be PDL, wall to wall, all the time, 100%. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There are going to be a few special places on planet Earth. And there's a few schools in here that might be some of those special places on planet Earth that really can do wall-to-wall -wall PBL all the time. Um, I think it is possible, but it's not what's going to be the norm. The norm is going to be a mixture of different learning experiences, but of which PBL should be a pretty key player. Um, and so I think that that's, that's what we, we want to dive out to. All right, now, though, I want to take a big transition and tell you a bit of my own personal story with this to give you foundational learning that I got to pick up really early. Liza is in the room earlier, the woman who's talking about Belgium. Uh, she got to send her kid to a school that we got to build from scratch here in Lexington. Uh, and others have had this experience. Some of you are, are currently engaged in building schools from scratch, like Sean that joined last time. I don't see Sean in the room right now, but he's actively building a school from scratch in Cleveland right now. And so um, we got to do that. <laughs> It was an amazing journey and, and great fun. But along the way, I feel like I got to learn something really important about inquiry that I want to convey to you all today because it really helps me see like what the overall task is. Um, so we were given this task to build this school from scratch. Uh, and really all we had to go on was a school in uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, that the superintendent at that time and uh, the dean of the College of Education that I work at sort of said, like, we like that one. So I'll give you a, just a super quick sense of we like that one as a starting place uh, for what we were supposed to do. <clears throat> you know, you can see this one's going to stop in a, in a minute or so in. So almost a decade ago at Battelle, uh, in partnership with The Ohio State University, we thought, boy, it would be really fun to start a school. Couldn't we do something really different? Uh, Metro is nestled on the uh, uh, near west side of Columbus, uh, Ohio, just outside of, or just on the campus of Ohio State University. We focus on personalized learning, STEM education, early college experiences. And so if you have a kid who likes to think out of the box and a kid who um, doesn't necessarily need the traditional type programming, that this is a school that you should probably check out. So for us, STEM is not, it's not a curriculum. It's not extra math classes. It's not extra science classes in the building. We have all those. We have technology. We have math. We have all of that stuff. But STEM is really about how the curriculum is delivered. It's about inquiry. A lot of times folks want to say STEM is about science, technology, engineering, and math. STEM is more about strategies that engage minds. All right. <clears throat> so I wanted to, you to get to that part of the equation. That particular school launches as a STEM school. And we were given 
And the name Steam, that was something that we were given. We weren't, we didn't choose it. Um, it's it's a popular thing that lives out in the world today. You're fully aware that STEM is a, is a thing that is popular. Um, that's not a surprise to you. Uh, it speaks to, those letters speak to something that is a fab, part of the fabric of society that many groups, uh, business groups in particular, really value. Um, and so you get a lot of this out there. And the reason I'm stressing this early is, it, number one, it's really important to understand in terms of inquiry. But, but secondly, politically, this is goldmine stuff, goldmine, in that when you can frame the work of deeper learning as STEM work or as CTE work or as industry work, that in communities makes so much more sense to many of our communities, rather than framing it as like, this is progressive education, this is constructivist learning, in all of those words that we also love, like, and I do love all of those words, but those words just don't make as much sense in a community as we're gonna have a school that focuses on doing science and engineering, and we're gonna build things and make things, and that, that stuff makes sense. Um, so, those letters worked for us, but we didn't know what to do with those letters. How do you actually have a school that prepares a whole bunch of engineers? Like, and just like Metro, in as you saw in that video, one of the things that very quickly we had to shift was STEM does not mean we're going to be some kind of like engineering medical prep school. That's not what we can do because it turns out that middle schoolers don't yet know that they want to be engineers when they choose to come to this school. Uh, and so, and, and that's their journey that to define. So we had to be quite different. Now, there's got, as always, lots of great research linked up in the Padlet. Go check it out. This is called Inclusive STEM. Um, I actually wrote a book chapter about this, and I linked up the book chapter in the Padlet. Um, so that is... Uh, I can't actually give you the book. You can go buy the book if you want. I just gave you the chapter, right? So don't go share out that link all over the internet if you would, please. Um, but th that is the the chapter that got written. Um, this is some some of the research. It, it's outstanding research. When like that one at the bottom, the STEM school study. Like, what do STEM schools actually do? When you open that up, what you'll see is they do a whole bunch of deeper learning. Okay. Yay, these pieces can fit together. The puzzle pieces can fit together, right? Remember what school could be academy? We're trying to put puzzle pieces together. So STEM and inquiry and deeper learning all live very tightly together. Uh, here is a bunch of those, the eight elements of a STEM school. And you can see that like problem-based learning, rigorous learning, community and belonging, CTE skills, personalization, community linkages, um, staff foundations, like that's all stuff that lives in a STEM school. Erin taught at a STEM school before taking her current job, and that's where my kid goes right now. Uh, so in terms of being um, a career tech center that happened to be good at STEM, Erin, do you think that like Elkhorn Crossing was generally doing these same things? Yeah, I think for the most part, when I look at, when I look at those, um... Yeah, I think we were hitting a lot of those. I think, you know, there were years we did it better. Um, but yeah, I think yeah. we were. Mm -hmm. Us too. Us, these are not magical. Don't hold yourself up to, you know, one of the things that President Biden uh, said that really stuck with me is don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And so we all have what these deeper learning schools should be in our heads. And all of us are thinking high tech high. And that's great. Lovely, it's good to see what really far extreme looks like, but don't compare yourself to that. Compare yourself to the alternative. And the alternative is the vastness of public education in America or Belgium or Qatar or wherever. And so compared to the alternative, I'm sh you guys are actually doing quite well at Elkhorn Crossing, very happy. So um, also I right. think, Justin, it's also, you know, just, just to, you know, ground ourselves in reality here you know, some schools have very good marketing departments, right? And so they're able to capture and tell their story in a really compelling way, 
but it's like the Instagram version, right? So it's not real. It's not the whole picture. So sometimes it's easy to get discouraged where we're like, oh, it's not, you know, we're, we want to be like that. And of course, that's great motivation. But we also have to realize that that's not the whole story, right? There are That's not happening 100% of the time, right? And if you talk to them, you know, these people at these schools, they'll honestly tell you, you know, it's not like that all the time. You know, the, everybody's continuing to, to do it. it. It is a journey. But I think what, what's important to sort of take away, and you were probably going to talk a little bit more about this, it's, it's how you frame your work is very important. The language you use when you talk about your work is very important. And how you sort of support your, uh, your work with the science of learning, it, it really strengthens what you're offering. And so if you can, if you can utilize some buzzwords, you know, but well, we know what it actually means. And then you can actually back up what you're trying to achieve with, you know, not arguable science. It's like, this is what learning looks like. This is what we know learning, how learning takes place. Then it becomes much more about uh, getting people excited, but how do we do this? Not like, what else are we gonna do? All right, lovely. Let me, and we're going to get off into discussion in just a second, um, this one. So I just want you to also know that this exists in the elementary world. There's a link to elementary STEM resources and, and stuff out there of inclusive STEM, just um, because I know like we want to see this in all contexts, and Ben's going to help us see that a little bit later. Uh, here's the book chapter, Inclusive STEM School Models, a Review of Characteristics and Impact. So if you want to go actually read a chapter, go for it. I don't, I don't know if you want to do that, but it's there. Um, here was the critical learning, though. The absolutely fundamental critical learning that completely changed the nature of our school once we understood this. That we were thinking about all those letters as a separate thing, and really, they're a single thing. And once we understood that those letters are a single thing, and they work together, then we knew how to build the school. So we, right, all the letters are there, S, T, E, A, and M. Those are the letters we had to deal with, but we put them in a slightly different order, and we told this story, that mathematics is a language of the universe. Science is a process of human inquiry. Engineering is the application of those to practical things. Technology is the result, and art is what makes it all human and beautiful and something we want to spend time with. It's one thing. It's a single thing. And then now that you can see a single thing, like, okay, we can do a clear job. We can start to focus on how to let students experience this single thing as often as possible in school. Um, and that really unlocked for us multiple pieces of the equation, but mostly what it unlocked for us was the absolutely central role of inquiry and the job that inquiry is doing in school and the job that inquiry should be doing in school. Um, so yeah, that, that rearrangement, hmm, that was, that transformed who we were. Um, so I, I love it and I just wanted to share it with all of you, but I really, really want you to know the political power of these letters and that these letters work with us in the deeper learning world. These things are, are working together. All right, now though, to that thing, the one that I think lives above the others. Sorry <laughs> for, uh, if you happen to be the super techie engineering mathematics type and artsy, like I love all those too, uh, but this one sort of drives the show. Um, science is a process of human inquiry. Uh, so over in the chat, like as we think about science, what are some of the disciplines of science that come to mind for you? Like scientific disciplines. When you think science, you think of, go for it. Throw them over in the chat. Biology. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Lo awesome. Yeah. Environmental. Yeah. Rapid fire. Throw them. Yeah. Throw them at us. Chemistry. Yeah. Love it. I always think of like space. You know? Oh, astrophysics? Yes. Yeah. Like what? I just, I can't even fathom. 
you know, you start to learn, you start thinking about like what is out there and what it means and how small we are and just like, what? I love, I love the data science one, Kristen. That is yeah. awesome. Well, well, um, love it. Oh yeah, physics, physics, physics. A lot of physics, a lot of physics. Yeah. <laughs> physics, like Newton is completely controlling our brain still. Yeah, he changed everything. <laughs> Newtonian <laughs> physics. Phenomenons inquiry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it, Kristen. Yes. Inquiry. Okay. Now I, I do all that to you because that's where our brain goes and something has gone wrong in the K-12 world. And I don't know why, um, but it has in that, like, when we think of this word science, we think of a pretty narrow band of disciplines that are the things that we've historically called science in school, biology, chemistry, physics, right? These are the, the things that our science classes. And so those tend to control our brains when we think of what is science. Here at the University of Kentucky, science also means all of these things. And many more. These are just the ones I threw on the slide. Um, anthropology, informatics, demography, plant science, computer science, social work, archaeology, sociology, political science, economics, statistics, all of this is also science. And for whatever reason, K-12 has really limited their thinking, K-12, uh, elementary and secondary education, you got to remember my international audience, uh, has really limited their thinking around what, what might we label as science in a building. But science Social science is also science. What's really important to know about that is that in terms of how to build a curriculum, you should almost always be building curricula as, as much as possible around inquiry, which will link you to science. So science and social studies is doing a whole bunch of the work in your building. And most people don't see that. And at elementary in America in particular, we really don't see that. Um, and that has is a huge miss for whatever reason. I don't know why that's happening. Um, so like, let me just convey to you the easiest pathway to deeper learning, like the easiest one, like forget PBO and gold standard. And we're going to talk about that, but like, forget all that. Put science back. See science, put it back. That's the easiest path, particularly in elementary. Like, let them investigate things, do things. And those questions do not have to exclusively be hard science questions. You know, let them investigate housing patterns. What an amazing social science question in America. Like, look at your own community. You know, what's going on with how these suburbs are working versus home prices in the, like kids love that stuff. Uh, and it's a great inquiry, even in elementary school to learn a lot about math and all the different things. Um, but that's, sort of missing. So as we kick off into this inquiry and deeper learning world, like I, I hope that you're gathering and seeing the relationship of science and inquiry to this entire question and sort of the simplicity of what's, what's the task. Like we need more science happening in school. And when we frame science as also social science, then it can live across a variety of domains. I'll tell you one last story and we go out to break out. Um, when we launched off into PBL at STEAM Academy, the best PBL teachers right off the bat were our English teachers. And our English teachers, yeah, well, I don't know. I'm just giving you, this is the facts. I don't know why this happened, but that's what happened. Um, the English teachers, very quickly launched off into a variety of social science projects. And so in some ways, our English teachers were quickly becoming our better social studies teachers, which is something I had to address with our social studies teachers um, around like, you know, these English teachers have now are doing all these amazing projects that are, kids are learning about community. They're, they're interviewing people in community, building birdhouses for them, trying to understand, you know, what their experience of living in the community is. And like very quickly, we were doing some amazing social studies in English class through projects. Um, 
that's only to say the possibility inherent in this space. So like with that all said, Ben, I wanna jump us out into our breakouts um, and yeah. give us- you wanna throw, throw, I got the breakout rooms uh, ready to go. Will you throw up that slide real quick? Um, yep, absolutely. Let me, let me, you know, just offer a, like a, a, a different way of thinking about this. If we could actually just like sort of focus on the inquiry part. And so science, you know, if we think about it, like you had that, that previous slide, it's a process of human inquiry. So sometimes you like when I start thinking science, I can't get like the science, you know, experiments out of my head. So I like to think about inquiry. All right. So if we can start with inquiry and then move towards, you know, what Justin's talking about, just think about the process of inquiring into something, the process of investigating, getting excited about something to, to go and investigate and learn about something. So we're going we're gonna to jump into breakout rooms and do a, a thinking routine called Imagine If, all right? And so we're going to ask you to sort of run through three different thinking scenarios with your, um, your group. So the first one, in what ways could inquiry be more effective in schools? And then we want to think about, you don't have to write these down because they're on the Padlet. Uh, in what ways could inquiry be more equitable in schools? And then finally, in what ways could inquiry be more beautiful in schools? All right. And so this is an activity on the Padlet, which we will drop the link in the chat for you. So you can all hit that if you don't have it up already. Uh, you'll see there's a, a column with like an arrow pointing down and you'll see a big project zero, which is uh, where we get all these thinking routines from uh, out of Harvard, which is amazing. If you haven't uh, checked out that resource, definitely do it. Um, but we're going to send you into breakout rooms, three to four people, we'll probably give you about, I don't know, seven to 10 minutes uh, to answer these questions. And Jennifer has a question. Jennifer, do you have a question? I see your hand up. Okay, but all right. So I'll, I'll just really repeat. So we're going to send you into breakout rooms. You have three to four minutes. Uh, these prompts are on the Padlet. You can definitely record your thoughts there. We love it when you do that. Does anybody have a question about the uh, process or what we're going to be doing now? If not, I'm going to open the rooms. Welcome back. Justin, how was that room here? I jumped in. Um, with Liza and Renee, and it was awesome. I didn't want to leave, but I felt guilty. I was leaving the, the main room <laughs> unsupervised. Um, and if we had yeah. any late joiners, I couldn't let them in. So it was really good. Um, There's awesome want? conversations that I got to yeah. be a part of. Others, feel free to jump in. Yeah, does anybody want to jump in, come off mute and share any uh, like awesome, awesome discussion points? talked about like especially in that first question of like how to be more effective we really talked about how we think that the adults because so many of the mindsets and lens set are so great like this is the way I learned this is the way I was educated and so really having them experience this um, type of deeper learning inquiry process so they can experience it as also a learner so true mm -hmm. Who else? We discussed the same. It's really a lot about the adults and the adults being able to feel comfortable and, and, and to be comfortable in the potential of failure, you know, and modeling for the kids that it's okay to fail spectacularly and, and engage them in, okay, how do we do this better next time? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think 100%. So I, I'm a firm, I do a lot of, you know, professional learning is sort of like how I spend my time. And I'm a firm believer that if you're going to ask a teacher to do something, you need to provide them with the resources to do it. And so that starts with adequately providing them the skills necessary to do what you're asking them to do. And uh, like, this isn't what we're trained on in, in teacher college. <laughs> like this doesn't, you know, this is not, this is new to us. And so like, if you know the work of Bandura, you know, he's all about efficacy and, and someone talked about efficacy a little bit earlier. And, you know, especially when you look at educational technology, if teachers have efficacy around the implementation of technology in the classroom, you'll see a 25% increase 
and people say, well, 25%, that's not really good. And it's like, well, we're not starting from zero. <laughs> you know, if you're starting at 50, now you're at 75, you're starting at 60, you're at 85. And actually, so if you name, like, give me one thing that gives you a 25% increase in the classroom, like you're not going to find many things. So efficacy is a huge, huge piece. And so when we, when we think about making large scale change, uh, increasing efficacy is, is massive. And so we have to think about how, how do we engage our learners, which are our teachers, in experiences that allow them to build that efficacy. Jump in, Mark, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say, um, I thought we talked about two interesting tensions, I thought. One was around um, control, not wanting to let go of control. Um, and yet needing structure. So I think there's something there about as you let go, I, I know in the literature that you gave us on the science of learning scaffolding, if you were to do a search, scaffold comes up a lot. And so I think, I think um, as like there has to be a synchronization between the letting go of sort of classic control and then some, some, some really clear guidance around what scaffolding looks like so that students just crash and burn, you know? Um, and so that transition, I think, has to be um, thought about ahead of time and then managed properly. And then the other tension was between like the gifted kids and the basic kids, you know? Like, oh, this is great. This inquiry thing is good for all those, you know, gifted kids that are probably gonna in inquiry their way into life anyways. And, but that might be a false dichotomy that, that we often adopt, um, that the basic kids have gifts that we just don't have the lens to see yet. And so what, as we let go of that control, what are the scaffolds that are gonna surface those, like, like the human brain is just built for inquiry, right? So even our basic kids are gonna be asking questions at some point. So how do we build the scaffolds around them? Like change the atmosphere so that their version of success surfaces, I think. Is, is like a hard question to answer. But I think that that was one of the themes that came out in our discussion. Mark, you nailed it. I think a lot of people think inquiry is just, oh, let the kids just think about things and they'll just follow their passions, right? But, uh, you know, it's called managed choice <laughs> within a classroom, right? Uh, and you're uh, like spot on with the scaffolding. And so like, like these thinking routines that we're using. So if you, if you, if you have time, check out uh, Project Zero's thinking routines because thinking routines are structures because they actually structure thinking. And so you're actually allowing students space to come at, come at it you know, from their own perspective, but you're still putting guardrails on the experience. And, and, and to further that, I think, Mark, what you really have to have in place are really strong classroom routines and expectations, right? Because if you're, if you're controlling your class through activities and workbooks and worksheets and everybody's you know, behaving a specific way, so you think they're learning, right? As soon as you remove that structure, it's just gonna, it, you know, things are gonna go crazy. But if you actually build structures around learning and thinking, right, and community expectations, then you can actually, like, loosen the reins, if you will, to allow kids to actually engage in, in learning, if you're making, like, making thinking visible, which is what we're, we're, we're sort of going to. So I think you, you, you touched on some really important things there, Mark. It was also a really good transition to the thing I feel like we need to do before we close up shop today, and so um, I'm going to pop back in and, um, and I'm going to pop back into a place that you probably know well. If you're living in a deeper learning world or you have spent time in deeper learning PDs, you inevitably will come across gold standard PBL from the Buck Institute. All right. And, and I love the Buck Institute or PBL works is what they call themselves now. Um, I love, 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 love uh, this, this work. It's as deep and as powerful as you're going to find. Um, and PBL Works does a lot of great trainings. Um, in fact, you can see down in the lower right-hand corner is PBL Works Kentucky because we have a huge multi-million dollar contract with them to do PD all across Kentucky right now. So that's awesome. <clears throat> okay, look, you can see the component parts. The component parts are the critical things. A challenging problem or question to drive an inquiry. 
that inquiry being sustained over time, not just like, let's take 15 minutes and go learn something. No, it's a sustained inquiry. It's got authenticity, relevance to real world kinds of problems, things that kids actually care about, uh, their student voice and choice along the way. There's a lot of reflection. This is Dewey coming in and saying like, you've got to give the kids time to reflect and learn and internalize and process. Uh, just with, as we were talking about with scaffolding, uh, critique and revision, all leading to a public product. Okay, I love it. I love every single component part of it, but this can be really overwhelming. The PBL Works approach uh, has tons of documentation that teachers are filling out um, along the way. There's project planning tools, all of which is good. This is great stuff. Um, so I, I love everything about it, but it, it all can be a lot pretty quickly. There are these really deep rubrics around PBL that live out there with PBL works. Um, so if you want to go massively deep, I put all the links are over there in the Padlet, go deep with PBL works. That's fine. They're awesome at it. But I'm here to tell you today, our experience of doing this work across a decade in Kentucky means I, I would ask you to keep it simple and to avoid all of that complexity early. Um, I see a lot of schools that are trying to do the deeper learning work get lost in PBL almost immediately, right out of the gate. All that complexity of trying to run a project, giving up control, managed chaos, the kids not knowing how to collaborate with each other, which we heard out in breakout rooms. There's just a lot of things that go differently and slash wrong right out of the gate with a PBL. And it can give people a really bad taste of deeper learning. And so I would encourage you to try to keep it simple in the early stages. There's lots of ways to do that. Uh, John Spencer, you know his videos, uh, there's many great videos, has the PBL by design. He lays it all, the whole thing out as more of a design thinking kind of process. So you can, you can use that design thinking framework. These videos are all in there. They're all also in the Padlet. So like go and check them out. Um, you know, like I, I want you to spend time with them. Um, but I let's get even more simple. I mean, like a design thinking kind of process. Let's get even simpler. Let's think more about a genius hour model in the early stages where like we don't have to change everything we're doing for three weeks to do this PBL. Can we change something that we're doing one day a week? Can we take one day out of the five, just one out of five, and then let kids investigate things that are critical to them? This works extremely well in English classes. So if you're a high school and you're like, I don't know how to get projects in my school. Well, they have to write about something anyway, right? Like we require them to be writing and researching about something anyway. Like a Genius Hour project works extremely well. It also works extremely well in the elementary context. Um, and then to that elementary context, and so this is a what school could be video also linked up. Uh, we try to we try to feature what school could be resources as much as we can. All of this lives in the community. It lives on the what school could be org homepage um, where you can get access to all this. Of course, it's in the Padlet too. But just giving you a sense that what school could be has put a lot of effort and money into going and making great videos of uh, what's going on and, and teachers conveying that. So go and check those things out. Um, but I wanna turn it over to Ben and make it even more simple. Ben has a ton of experience working at the elementary level, working with elementary teachers in a coaching role. So over to you for how this, how this can work. Cool, so before I jump into that, just to sort of uh, follow up with a couple things you said there, Justin, um, when, when looking at implementation, like just focus on one piece, you know, and so then work on seeing how that one piece works. And then after you run the project, reflect on how that one piece went and may maybe make some slight adjustments. And so you don't have to do it all at once, like keep, break it down into the component parts. And one of the things that's also on the, um, the Padlet is a project tuning protocol. And this is something that Melissa Daniel shared with me. Uh, she works at High Tech High Graduate School now, but she was the um, she ran one of the middle schools for a number of years. Um, and this project tuning protocol is amazing, and it's super simple. There's two versions. There's a 25 minute version and a 60 minute version. Uh, as you can tell, probably by now, I'm a huge fan of protocols. 
but this one involves students and the projects always get way better after running this protocol. And so it's a way to really gather a lot of information on how you can improve really quickly. All right. Okay. So um, I am a huge fan of inquiry, right? And so I, I think I mentioned when we started, I, most of my time that I spent teaching, so I spent 20 years in a class in, in a school and about uh, 13 years in classrooms. And most of my time was in kindergarten, the most time I spent in any one, one year level. Um, and so I was an in inquiry driven teacher. And the reason I love inquiry is because it's student centered. Uh, it allows for a high level of student agency. So just click every time I say a word, Justin, you can click. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, it, it's collaborative. And then it's also interdisciplinary. All right. And so those are, and if you, you think about like what we've been talking about, the science of learning and deeper learning, like all of those things fit squarely within the science of learning and within deeper learning. All right. So uh, one of the things that actually really kicked my inquiry into like the next level is I actually ran a one-to-one -one iPad pilot program in 2012, if you can imagine, like over 10 years ago. All right. And if you notice here, one of the things that really blew my mind was when I handed out iPads, all the kids wanted to talk about what they were learning and what they were doing all the time. So it totally changed how I saw technology in the classroom because it was those were the days when you took the kids to the uh, computer lab and everybody sat at their own computer and there was like this one thing and kids couldn't see each other. So it sort of changed my mind. In, in the way I looked at inquiry, but in collaborative inquiry, all right? So Justin, can you hit the next slide? So I really got into actually working on projects, uh, but I had a lot of other, so there's me the, in my 30s, so you can tell that it was a while ago. <laughs> I had more hair then. Uh, so uh, it really got me not only into projects in the classroom, but I actually started working on collaborative projects. So uh, here you can't really tell, but we're actually, uh, conversing with another other classrooms around the world where we created these Twitter groups. And so we actually leveraged Twitter to have conversations around what we were learning with other classes. And through this, uh, you know, what, what are kids naturally interested in? Kids are naturally interested in stories, right? And so we started actually talking about different stories that we were reading and, and we, you know, they started talking about different stories that they would be interested in writing. And that led to us collaboratively writing stories with other uh, classes in different parts of the world. And then we thought, well, how can we capture this and how can we share this? So the kids actually, you want to hit that next slide, Justin, the kids actually um, created an ebook, illustrated it, and then published it in the iTunes uh, bookstore. So it was out for anyone to uh, go and <clears throat> find. So of course, um, you can see here, it says like this, one of the kids who wrote it uh, is, is reviewed it himself. So Justin Beerkamp, uh, this is the best book. I had a lot of fun writing this book with my class and another class that was in, in Japan, right? My family read it and like, you know, grandpa and Nana in Iowa, we were living in uh, East Coast Borneo, Indonesia at the time. Grandpa and, and Nana in Iowa were reading it and leaving reviews and like all of a sudden, we, we were talking about, you know, reading stories, right? Kids started to inquire into what does it mean to be an author? What does it mean to write stories? What does it mean to tell stories, right? So they went from, you know, being read to, and then at the end of this inquiry, actually being published authors, okay? And so you'll, you'll see like, it takes like you sort of, Mark mentioned earlier, we had to scaffold that process. I didn't just let, let, you know, set the kids free and say, think about, you know, being an author. I scaffolded them through that process, but they were the ones who drove the direction. They, they came up with the story, they came up with the characters, they came up with the drawings. Of course, I helped on the, the back end of like capturing their work and then publishing it for them. But here's another thing. So they were super into, you know, this was followed by, you know, you know, there's this big discussion going on at the time about banning toys. And I know toys, you know, this is a hot button issue. You can't bring toys in this and that, but the, the, what, what came out of it was, you know, kids love toys because it allows them to engage in ideas, 
right? So I said, okay, well, I want to follow some ideas here. So they were super into Star Wars at the time. So this uh, is a uh, a picture of kids making a stop animation movie uh, about Star Wars. So they actually wrote a wrote a story. And then they decided they wanted to make a movie about this story. So they created a stop motion uh, video of this story that they created, but all their friends were super interested in it too, all these friends that they were talking with. So what the kids came up with is they wanted to share the finished story, the, the finished stop motion movie, but they didn't want to share the, their version of that with audio. So they shared the video sans audio. So they just shared the video, no audio with about six other classes. And then the classes based on the video came up with their own storyline, added their own audio. And so then we had six different versions of this really cool video. So if you hit that next slide, uh, Justin, you'll see it's uh, Escape from the Dark Side was the name of their uh, Thing. And it was only like 52, uh, 52 seconds long, but we had six totally different storylines set to this 52 second stop animation movie. And you can see, uh, you know, the set design and everything like that. And so, you know, just to give you a taste, uh, you know, we're talking about stories. So it was very based in literacy, but then we got really into math because they had to figure out how many frames it was going to take to make the scene long enough to actually, uh, read the audio. So they had to record themselves saying the line and then see how long it was. And then they had to make the, the, the video version of that scene long enough so they could actually say the lines over that. So we're talking, uh, you know, literacy, numeracy, it got really, really, and they were super into it. So it got really cool. And then they shared it out and got it back, et cetera. So what does this look like uh, 10 years down the road? All right, so one of my former students uh, who's sort of engaged in education in this uh, project uh, way um, had to do what is a, is a capstone project. And typically kids write essays. Uh, it's, it's the combination of uh, MYP, which is the middle years program for IB. They, 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 most kids write an essay. So he decided to make an album. So he found out how to create a record label uh, found out how to get Spotify accounts, uh, Apple Music accounts, uh, any any major streaming platform. Uh, learned Final Cut, not Final Cut, uh, Logic Pro on a Mac. Set up a recording studio in his um, bedroom. Wrote nine songs, lyrics. Wrote nine songs uh, musically. Recorded, edited, produced, published uh, on Spotify and Apple Music. And I thought, why? I was thinking about this. this. This actually just went live like two days ago. And I was thinking to myself, where in the world would they think to publish you know, their music out on Spotify or Apple Music? And then I realized, go to that next slide, Justin. This kid is my son, who's this kid in the green shirt right here. And I went back to kindergarten and he's a published author. And so he consider, considers himself a musician. So why wouldn't he do the same thing with his music that he did with his writing? And so the, the PBL approach or experience really allows kids to become what they are doing. So if we're talking about engaging in science, they are scientists and they are creating things that live in the world that scientists do. If they are authors, they are creating content the same as authors and then putting that out into the world, right? They consider themselves these things. And so uh, I think it was just it sort of it kind of hit me uh, this week that this, this way of engaging in learning, it, there is no disconnect between I do this for school so that I can get a grade. It's I do this because this is something I do right? It's, and I'm going to find a way to do it. And so he, 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 he was successfully, you know, putting all the pieces together and doing all this because he had learned how to do it by just doing it. So I hope that sort of gives you a little bit of a, a real world example and, and a way to look at it from maybe a kindergarten to now a sophomore in high school. Thanks, Ben. It's awesome to get that sort of 
example of what can be done. The, they are super powerful devices all over your buildings to do all kinds of this work, like most of what you need to do to do any of that stuff is already in your buildings. Uh, we're just not deploying it that way most of the time. Thoughts? Like, I'd make like sense to pop of, go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, I'm sorry. I would just like to pop in and say thank you for showing an elementary example because I've, I'm elementary background, and if you talk to me at all, you already know that. But um, I like it, it seems like everywhere I go with this, it's all it's mostly focused on middle school, high school, and knowing what my kids could do and what they wouldn't do. Like when I pulled them for when I was in the enrichment process and would try to get them to think, they were you know right after kindergarten, they're shut down, they're trained not to ask questions, not to do inquire, not to do all that. So I just wanna thank you for showing that example because we have to start there for them. And if we start there, just think of what it, they can be when they get to middle school and high school. So thank you for bringing that out. I really appreciate that. Awesome, thanks Stephanie. And I think you're right because, uh, you know, what, what you focus on, especially in the early years is that metacognition. It's helping those kids understand who they are as learners and how they learn. And so isn't that what we want them to know? right? And so if you teach them that, then they become, you know, owners of their own learning. Yeah, lovely. And Stephanie, that's exactly, I mean, I, exactly. All of this gets built out from middle and high school. And I get that. I'm a, I'm, Ben is a kindergarten guy. I, I'm, of course, a high school guy. And so, uh, you know, like, I think it is good to see this in the elementary formats, um, and elementary teachers are pretty naturally skilled at this, actually, too. Like, um, elementary teachers have a lot of built-in expertise to do this kind of project work with kids. Uh, and so uh, it's a matter of permission. I, I, I've seen a lot of elementary schools move rather fast because, like, what their teachers have been waiting for is permission. Um, and so once they get it, like, you'll see some cool stuff happening right away. Yeah, Mark, jump in. Well, that's kind of where I was going in my my questioning is is you were in an environment where that was permitted, like and maybe even encouraged. Would I like I'm trying to, I'm now I'm trying to picture the context within which you were doing that, and I'm imagining an administrator coming in and saying, "Way to go! Like this is awesome." That would be number one. No, not really. Oh, <laughs> but okay, yeah, okay. I, so, I, I did. I, I you know I had the I had the reading specialist you know breathing down my neck about you know why aren't you studying these hundred words and you know we're gonna give them this test and you know this sort of thing and I just said okay and then I just ignored it so I was not a a, a very good employee. <laughs> but okay, so Mark, well, so I but I, what I want to say is the evidence is hard to argue with. So if you stick with it, what you come up with and what the students are able to produce as evidence of learning is way beyond what some silly score would be on a, on a sight word test. Well, I, I was looking, like those are kindergarten students writing reviews, correct? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and so like, so like the reason I shared the technology piece is because what technology allows students at that age to do is really engage with multiple modalities. And so there's text, uh, text to speech, there's audio, there's, you know, there's all sorts of ways for them to actually capture their thinking and get it out. Uh, so if like if I was going to sit down and actually have like I remember one of my students put was like it took them forever to write and I'm not discounting writing, but I would just have them do text to speech dictation. And he would like, you know, capture his, the beginning of his story to get it out of his mind and, you know, out invisible. And then we would start working from there. So you can leverage tech in ways that actually, you know, sort of helps move kids to a space where they can actually move to that higher level when we're not stuck in that lower level stuff. Okay, let us, let me bring it home for today and then we can pick back up again on Tuesday. Yeah, sorry, I'm we... just, I just get... I keep no, no, we're doing you know, awesome. About we're doing stuff. awesome. And in fact, <laughs> essentially, I think today we're learning together the thing that I want us to learn early in the academy. And this is hard one learning that I've, if you're in this world of trying to build deeper learning schools or help transition deeper learning schools, 
you have to learn patience with PBL. P PBL is the good stuff. It is the stuff that is the fun, right? These stop motion animation videos, like who doesn't love that? It's amazing. And we all want that super fast. However, you must both scaffold for the kids and scaffold the entire school to be ready for this so that your school is ready for the permission that Mark is looking for, right? Like, how do we get the administrators to the place of giving that permission? How, how do we help our teachers begin to see the role? All of this makes a strong argument for PBL patients when it comes to deeper learning. Um, I put into the Padlet and we won't be able to do all this next time. And so there's just gonna be a bunch of stuff that we can't get to and that's fine, that's normal. Um, we love Magnify Learning. This is a, one of our uh, elementary school principals just this year with the brand new book, PBL Simplified from Ryan Stoyer and Magnify Learning. I've got videos from Ryan in there. Um, and in this video, Ryan actually talks about the exact thing that I wanted to talk about um, around like from a leadership standpoint you know, what are we doing around PBL? We'll get to all, maybe I'll come back, who knows? Um, just advancing us forward. But from a leadership standpoint, with PBL, you're gonna exercise strategic patience, all right? So this is a critical learning of deeper learning schools that you, as you must get it. Strategic, you're gonna get to PBL. It's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be amazing. But if you start with this without building structure first, it's going to be a mess and everyone's going to lose their mind and get angry with you. So this is a learning that we've had from a decade of doing this work in Kentucky is like in the in the early stages of this, do not center PBL as the primary change driver in your building. We're going to talk about all the other drivers in the what school could be academy, right? So there's going to be a lot of stuff we talk about, but early you're not gonna let PBL be the driver. First, there's gotta be a shared vision around the goals, right? You're gonna build things like a portrait of a graduate. That's what CKC was working on yesterday. Good job, team. Um, you're gonna to start to put in place assessment and exhibition models, right? So how does this, how does this find value in our assessment system? How does this go out to the public so they see what we're doing? We're making amazing stop motion animation videos. People should see this. But if you have no structure for that, it's just going to get lost. Um, you've got to get super serious with training for teachers. You're asking them to do something quite different than what they are expecting to do. And you really have to have a commitment to free up time. Without those things in place, PBL is going to launch as like these little bitty bits and bites, and it's going to be disconnected from everything. And the kids are going to be confused, and the teachers are going to be confused, and the parents are going to be confused. And you're going to get frustrated as a leader. And so this is just, it's just not the place to start. We had to learn this from this book, Transforming Schools. And this book comes out of the work of building the Envision Schools in California, Bob Lins, Justin Wells. Um, and this, this book is about 10 years old now, but we, it was a critical transitional moment in our work in Kentucky. Once we understood that the pedagogies sort of come last, like, the first thing to have in place is portraits of a graduate. Then you need to have, how does this fit into the structure, or the assessments, all of those kinds of things. And so, and then finally, with, when you have structure in place, then we really start to work on the pedagogy's question. Um, that is how we are gonna turn our attention next. Um, so uh, we'll, I'll touch us back around on PBL on Tuesday again, um, but, I, we tee up PBL early in the What School Could Be Academy because everybody wants to get to that awesomeness that Ben just shared, right? That's that's where we're going to try to get to. So it's good to know where we're going. But from our standpoint, as deeper learning leaders, our job is to help build a whole bunch of structure to let teachers go do that amazing stuff all the time. And so where we'll turn to next is how to begin to build that structure. Begin to Put, a, put something in place that the puzzle pieces can start to live inside of uh, that we uh, can, can build out. So we'll turn our attention next to student voice um, and really listening, paying attention to the margins, seeing the school in a new way. Like one of the very early things that deeper learning leaders do is they just see the school differently. 
kids see it. So like, it's not like no one sees it, but they, you need to have a structure to let that information flow move forward. Uh, so we'll start to talk about student agency, student voice, uh, and equity and marginal, listening to the margins up next before we get to the end of sprint one next Thursday. So one week from now, we will end sprint one. That's how fast these sprints go. Exactly. I mean, it feels like we literally just started and now we're almost at the end of sprint one. So um, we will end it next Thursday by giving you a task around listening to some kids. But I hope that makes sense of we're going to get to the good stuff, but we've got to exercise strategic patience as leaders and build structure first. And we'll talk a little bit about some leadership ways of being, too, and ways of thinking as well, just to give you some, some tools to use as a leader. And it doesn't, uh, when we say leader, it, we're not specifically talking about people in positions with a leadership title. We're talking about anybody who's doing, who's leading deeper learning work at a school. So you could be anybody at a school, uh, but we're going to give you some tools and strategies to use and ways of thinking, um, like big levers that you can pull to move, you know, objects or move programs even. Um, all right. So we are wrapping up. Apologies. I like a stickler for ending on time and we, we actually ended four minutes late. So I apologize. Um, but on the Padlet, we have our, our regular sort of wrap up, our Connect Extend Challenge. If you want to jump on there, uh, let us know what you connected to. Let us know what we how we extended your thinking a little bit, or how um, you know we we collectively extended uh, our own thinking. And then what's sort of still challenging for us, or what new challenges have arisen through our discussion today. And then there's also a, an extra question on there today. We sort of want to gauge your. Um, your comfort with the discussion. So do you want to like less discussion, more discussion or about the same, not us discussing because Justin and I, we, uh, we talk too much, but the, the discussions in breakout rooms. So I maybe I should, I don't know if I did say breakout room. So we want to know are the breakout rooms about right, too short, too long. Uh, just let us know. And we will see you next Tuesday, which I will be back in my house in Bangkok next Tuesday, and then I'll be somewhere else on Thursday. <laughs> awesome. Have a great weekend all. See you all next Tuesday. We'll hang in the Thanks. room. But often, yeah. Have a great day ahead. If you want to say something or have a chat, just hang out. Yep. Come off mute. But thanks for your time and energy today. Thank you, everyone.